everyone. Kia ora koutou and welcome. I'm Janice Mackay, your host, and I'm the Welcoming Communities Advisor for Ashburton District Council. Welcome to this free and live webinar covering all things digital marketing. We're so pleased to have you join us along with Ashley Rushton from Rushton Marketing, Sarah Stevens from Pixel and & Inc, and Tracy Kruger from House of Jam for a chat about all things digital. Our guest, Ashley Rushton, is an all-round marketing guru. She founded Rushton Marketing over six years ago and has since helped many local businesses keep up with the latest marketing trends. Our next guest, with more than 20 years experience as a hairstylist and salon owner, Tracy Kruger hit the e-commerce ground running when she founded her business Legwear Safari in South Africa. This business then saw her listed as one of the top 50 businesswomen to watch in Entrepreneur Magazine 2019. Tracy now advises her clients how to through her company, House of Jam. Finally, Sarah Stevens is a highly regarded web wizard who creates high performing websites in truly stunning fashion for clients all over New Zealand through her business, Pixel and Inc. Over six years ago, she founded the Mid Canterbury Woman in Business Group, which now has over 300 members. These webinars were put together to help build community resilience, showcase a snapshot of our local expertise, and to spark ideas and connections. So today, this will be an interactive session. Please feel free to send your questions to the panelists during the course of the webinar. You can do so either in the chat box, which is off to the side, you can um, send a message just to the panelists. Or if you'd prefer your question to be anonymous, please feel free to use the Q and A box, which is down the bottom of the screen. We will also be running a series of polls during the session, and these will also be anonymous, and they might give you some little insights into what all the other attendees are thinking. All right, I will now hand it over to you, Ashley, Sarah, and Tracy. Thanks, Thanks Janice. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in our little digital jam here this morning. Um, We've had quite a few questions that have come in before the, the webinar, so we thought we'd kick off with answering a few of those. Um, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box, um, and if you're not keen to do that, all of our details will be provided after the webinar, so you can just flick us a mail afterwards and um, chat to us separately if you'd like to. Um, We've got quite a lot of website questions, obviously. So um, sorry if we're going to put Sarah on the spot to start. Um, <laughs> but one of the questions that came through then was, when it comes to the website build, what is the most important part to spend money on? Should it be images, copy, marketing, or design? I have to say all of it yeah. to that question. <laughs> um, I think everything kind of glues it together. Um, and it's important to get all of those elements together. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that um, when you talk about the fundamentals of a, of a high performing website, a lot of people, particularly me when I started my own website, I didn't really know, I had a small budget, I didn't really know what was the most important element to spend money on. Um, and the biggest mistake I made with my website, my first one, was to not leave enough money for marketing afterwards. Um, so I think that when you work with a designer and or a developer, and they're going to help you put your ideas together, um, rather put your ideas together in stages so that you would do stage one of your website, what you need right now, building up to what you need later, instead of trying to do it all at once and blowing the budget right off the bat. Um, but we're gonna have a lot, there's quite a lot of um, questions around that, so we'll dig deeper into that as we go on. Um, there was a market, quite a lot of marketing questions that came through as well. So um, for Ashley, how much money should I be spending on advertising for my business every month? How long is a piece of string? Um... <laughs> It really depends what you're trying to achieve and who your customers are and what you're trying to sell as well. 
I mean, we have some clients who might just spend $500 a month and I myself at the moment, I'm only spending maybe 400 tops a month. Um, and then I've got other clients who are spending, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars a month on the advertising um, if they're trying to reach, say, for example, farmers nationwide. Um, I always like a bit of a challenge. Sometimes I think it's really easy to just throw a bunch of money at a bunch of stuff and hope for the best. But I actually get a little bit more excited when I get a client who comes to me and they say, right, this is literally all I've got to spend. And it could be, as I say, five hundred dollars a month. It's more of a challenge then to prioritize and really really think about what the best platforms are so you, you I mean you could just be spending $500 a month as, as I am um, or you could how long is a piece of string really um, you can be smart with any budget that you've got to play with and as I say sometimes it's easier to just throw a bunch of money at stuff and um, get those results we've had quite a few questions uh, starting to pop in I'll just grab the first one there. Um, I think this one will be good for Sarah, for all of us. How often should you change images on your website or update the content? Absolutely. So I tend to advise to change your images on your homepage at least seasonally. Um, seasons change, your product offering changes, um, you get new stock in, but I would say a minimum of every month to keep that content on your homepage fresh and exciting for new visitors. Um, yeah, so monthly at the very least, every season. Okay. Um, another question has come through is how important is SEO when building a website? Um, so I have a crack at that, that answer. So your search engine optimization is, is, um, quite a, a big part of your website um, and there's so many elements of it that contribute to you being able to appear in a search so um, I would say it's vitally important um, and it may, it's made up by a lot of little things so images that are labeled correctly with um, so when you search for an image red shoes comes up red shoes Ashburton or red shoes online instead of just image 8954 that's not going to come up in somebody's search so correctly labeled images, um, headings that correspond to your SEO, meter data in the back end. So all of these little things contribute to you coming up in search organically, which means that when somebody searches for you, you're coming up in a search from not a paid ad. So SEO is vitally important because there's no point in having a beautiful flashy website if nobody can find you. And without SEO, even SEO optimization, having those elements in place, you're essentially invisible. Um, there's another question that just came in here. Oh, no. Nope. Sorry, we're trying. Oh. Sorry, I was just trying to work out the questions there. Said, uh, there was a question for Ashley, but I'm not quite sure what it was. It's okay, I replied and just asked what it was. Oh, okay. Um, some of the other questions that have come through is, oh, that's a good one, is what is organic reach? Maybe you should grab that one, um, Ashley. Um, in terms of social media, um, well, reach is effectively how many uh, people or how many news feeds a piece of content has um, appeared on, right? So there's two ways you can get eyeballs. There's through organic reach and there's paid reach. So paid reach is quite self-explanatory. That's when you pay Facebook or Instagram to show that piece of content to people in your target audience. Organic reach is um, basically how the algorithm picks up that piece of content and shows it to um, your fans and followers. So. Um, it's, it's basically the algorithm driven way of getting your content shown. Um, so ways to increase that would be posting um, really quality content that your uh, followers are actually interested in. Um, posting really authentic content as well. So often on social media, people don't want to see the um, shiny, professional, well-written things. Um, they want authentic stuff. They want to see how you look, sound, and feel like as a person effectively. Um, I hope that helps explain <laughs> Um, paid, paid reach, paying Facebook and Instagram for eyeballs, organic reach is the algor algorithm picking up that piece of content and showing it to X amount of people. So if I, was, uh, if I came to you as a client and I said, how, how do I um, get my organic reach as strong as possible without spending money? What, what would I need to do? 
You'd need to start off by looking at your page insights. Um, so actually seeing what pieces of content you've put out over the last six months to a year, picking up what themes of content have been getting good organic reach. So whether it's, um, say for example, whenever I post a photo of my children, <laughs> I get a lot of organic reach. So people like to see what I look like behind, when I, what I look like when I'm at home. Um, so you could pick up little um, trends of really strong posts and then do more of that moving forward. Um, another way to build reach would be to encourage engagement from people. So that could be as simple as asking people for their feedback on posts, asking people to like, like and comment on your posts. Um, the more that you can keep a piece of content alive through things like that will help your organic reach in the long run as well. I, I just want to build on that a little bit about now particularly is is how do people um get that engagement or get that organic reach and how do they communicate with people especially if they're not operating at the moment or they're closed or they on this sort of skeleton crew transition between um being closed and being open um how do you what suggestions do you have for people as to what kind of things they should be posting at the moment um, I think everybody's sick of the the, the COVID-19 post. Mm -hmm. so what, what kind of things can they post now to get the most? What are people wanting to see now? Yes, you've always got to remember that um, people are using social media to be social with you. They, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. So um, even though you're not, if you're a tradesman, you're not at work at the moment, so you don't have pictures of your plumbing and your finished products and that sort of thing, People are wanting to connect with you on a more personal level. So they want to see what you look like at the moment at home in your bubble. Um, they want to see, you know, little plans that you've got coming up. They want to see your garden. Um, they want to see different connections. They want to form that, um, <laughs> got a visitor? <laughs> we made it 15 minutes in team. <laughs> It's all good, all good. <laughs> they want to make those personal connections with you and find out what you're like behind the scenes. Um, so you could be posting, you know, a day in the life of your bubble. You could also be posting um, creative things. I've actually been really inspired by watching the hair salons. I've yeah. Watched, um, seen the likes of Minx and Tangles and stuff posting their videos and their tips and stuff. You know, they're not in salons being able to show before and after photos of cuts and colours but they've been going in, you know, um, and sh showing us what to do with our regrowth and how to style our hair so that we feel good over the lockdown and things like that. So thinking outside of the square and thinking what your audience would be interested in um, and trying to make them smarter and make them smile. And I think at the moment that's really important. Yeah, no, I, I think so. Um, one of the things that we did with my hairdresser is, um, you know, with her being closed and she's just got such a, um, she's got such a, a wonderful little salon at home that's just so different. It's how do, the people that miss her, how do we still connect with her? So we came up with the idea that she puts together her salon playlist into Spotify and she shared it on her Facebook page so that people who miss the salon can kind of connect with the salon in that way. And it was such a big hit. I mean, we still listen to her vibey tunes when you're at home and, you know, just that that connection with your clients, all these little things that you do um, make a big difference. Um, so a question that's come in for Sarah is, um, I want to have an online store, but start with just a standard website. How do I do that? Absolutely. So I'd suggest starting small, getting those fundamentals right of, your like your homepage, your about your services, your products that you offer, um, and growing it from there when you need to, when you've got the start of it right. Um, generally, with clients of mine that have done that, we've started with a small service-based web a WordPress website, um, and then added on e-commerce when they're ready to go. Yeah, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of questions coming through, so um, uh, we're going to work through them slowly um, and probably what we'll do at some point is just press pause on the questions and move them to a QA and a after, afterwards. Um, but I promise you that we won't miss anybody and that we will get through there. Um, there's a question here saying, we have a small cheese business and feel that our organic reach dropped after we started paying for Facebook promos. Is that observation normal? 
Sorry, I've got to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> no, not typically. Um, that shouldn't typically be normal. So maybe um, send me a quick message after this and we can try and nut out what happened with that. But typically, no, that wouldn't be something that we would see. Um, another question that's come in also website related is, uh, if I decide to refresh my website, will I lose my content and design from my old website? Cool. So that one there, it's a bit of a tricky question to ask. It depends on what website platform you are on currently. Um, with the website platforms that we work mainly WordPress, there are a lot of migration tools that we can pick a lot of the content out and pop it into your new website. Um, or if you're staying with the same platform, then we can absolutely save it all. Yes. Okay, cool. So if you had an older website that was maybe just a content-based site um, with just a little bit of information on and you wanted to align that now with where your business was um, and perhaps add on an online store at a later stage, you could just move the content over and just refresh the look and feel. Is that kind of how it would Absolutely, work? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and then the question to follow on for that is, what is the best platform to have my website on? Oh gosh, that's a tricky question. I predominantly work with WordPress and Shopify. Um, WordPress I tend to use for your service-based businesses. Um, for that growth, you can start so little with a one-page website um, through to your full-blown sort of 20 pages um, with extra products and services and have e-commerce with it as well and it has so many awesome features. Um, or if you're predominantly e-commerce, um, then Shopify is my go-to. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, uh, following on to that, Sarah, was uh, another question about how important are the colors that you use on a website? That's a good question. I think being in line with your branding is good. I think it's very important. Um, the last thing we want to see is, I don't know, bright teal and it's flashy in your face. Um, but keeping it in line with your branding, keeping it mm. cohesive, I think that's the biggest piece uh, of advice I could give. And uh, just from me to add on there, so in terms of professional branding, what does that entail and should you should you cook this up on your own or should you go to somebody to to design your brand style for you i would suggest working closely with a designer i think graphic designers know what they're doing and um, they've been doing it for a very long time and um, they can look at the overall um of what your brand entails who your target customers are and design in a way that fits and to get the best out of it there's just a lot of psychology that goes in behind brand design as well. It's not um, sometimes as easy as just picking a pretty picture and popping your name on it. Um, there's a lot of psychology that you need to look at to make sure that it's going to work and appeal to your target audience and also make sure that it's going to stand the test of time. Um, a good logo and a good brand, you know, should be lasting you, you know, five years before you need to tweak it and update it a little bit. Um, so there is a lot that kind of goes on behind the scenes as well. Yeah, so I think a good a good starting point for that would be, and just to be clear, that, that your branding, like a branding package is generally done by a graphic designer who specializes in that, who takes all of the elements of your your brand and your values and, and all of those kinds of things and it puts it together in things like fonts and colors and um, how that all ties in to your whole brand as a whole, and then works together with your web designer um, to put that together in a cohesive display um, shop window. Uh, just uh, got a message in from, we're gonna have a poll that's coming up quickly onto your screen. Um, with, with Janice is gonna quickly just pop a poll up there, you should see it. Um, with a question, I think the most important thing for a website is, and then just pick um, pick a, a choice there from design, images, copywriting, or marketing. It's no wrong answer. Uh, it's just a good idea to see to see what everybody thinks. And as soon as um, everybody's voted, Janice will count up those votes and we'll get the results on the screen after that. So you should have a few seconds 
to figure that out. Um, oh, just going back to the branding question, Sarah. So what, what would you advise somebody who doesn't have a professional branding portfolio that has been done for them? Would you still be able to put, the, put some stuff across for them in terms of their color and topography and, or their fonts? Um, or would you recommend they have that done first? Ideally, I'd recommend for them to have that done first. Um, we definitely find it a lot easier to create a website for somebody that has really strong branding in place. Um, but we can sort of pick things and go from there when we do our strategy. Again, going back to that target customer and working with what they've already got. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, oh, we got some the poll results in. Um, so. 73% of you think that design is the most important thing. Win for you, Sarah. 24% <laughs> uh, think that images are the most important thing. 17% uh, for copywriting and 20% for marketing. Uh, when we just go back to what the most important thing is for your website, it's actually every single one of those elements is fundamental to a high performing website. I see copywriting was low on that. I'm quite used to that. <laughs> I'm the one who does all the copywriting. People are like, oh, we don't need to pay for that. Um, but when it comes to copywriting for your website, um, yes, you might know your story about your brand better than anybody else. And you might be able to explain it to anybody, you know, better than anybody else. But to be able to put it together in a, in a short and sweet polished version of that to be able to you know when people land on your website when you've got a very short space of time to be able to get your message across and that's where professional copywriter comes in is to be able to put your message across into something that will grab somebody's attention and get them into a conversion as soon as possible so all of those things are really really important for a website good imaging is essential because if your imaging is blurry or what we call pixelated or it's falling off the side of a screen on a mobile and you're not entirely sure what it is that's going to let you down right off the bat so all of those things tie in to making sure that your website's efficient it's not so much that you need to have the most expensive website or you need to have the most pages on your website but you need to have the fundamental basics there and i would say that those fundamental basics are things like mobile responsiveness um, your seo so having correctly labeled images, having your copy um, that's cohesive to your headings, all of those things that contribute to you coming up in search, um, having good speed of your website. There's nothing more frustrating than landing on a website and it's just taking forever to load, You're waiting for the image to load or the video or um, the text. Um, navigation is essential because that's ease of access to information. When somebody lands on your website and you have and they have to look around for what, what it is they need or trying to work out what it is that you sell or you do, like you've lost them already. So having all of those elements in, in the right place at the right time is going to be the best thing that you can do. Okay, I'm getting a lot more questions coming in here. So yeah, just telling us to clear all the ones we've answered. We can't <laughs> even scratch the surface. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, so... <Jada>. <laughs> There's one for you, Ashley. Um, advertising in the paper, mags, and radio versus Facebook. Which is the best? And should you consider all of them? Which one would you pick if you had to pick one? I'm going to apologize in advance because I know Jane from MediaWorks is sitting in the corner. <laughs> um, I have to say, Facebook and Instagram advertising at the moment, man. The, results we're getting from people for the spend that they're putting in is absolutely phenomenal. Um, we have just done some ads for a hypnotherapist who is doing stop smoking online sessions, which you think at the moment everyone's far too stressed to think about stop smoking. <laughs> and, um, 250 bucks and he got 78 inquiries from it. Um, we've just wow. done another one for a florist in Christchurch for Mother's Day. Her ad has been running for seven days. She spent uh, $90, I think it was last night when I checked. Her Facebook ad has been seen by 14,000 people. Um, she's had about 300 people click through to the website. We've got another one running for her at the moment. Again, only seven days. Um, it's around website consult, um, wedding consults and stuff. And she's already had six inquiries um, from that as well. So the, 
the rapid response that you can get from social media advertising at the moment is absolutely kicking butt. Um, so I'm sorry, Jane. Um, everything, <laughs> else, everything else is still super important. Um, your radio is still super important for your overall brand awareness. You've got to think at the moment we're all at home. Um, chances are, if you don't have Peppa Pig on TV like I do, you've probably got your radio playing in the background um, all day. Um, so you've got a lot of exposure opportunity there as well. Um, so they still hold a very important place in your marketing strategy, but if you've got a very small budget um, and you're wanting some immediate results, I would be looking at social media advertising. Yeah, I, I think that ties in with another question that just came in underneath that, which says, uh, how do you decide which marketing media to sink your tiny budget into for a service-based business? Mm -hmm. Would you still advise that Google, a combination of Google ads and Facebook for that? You've got to think about who your audience is as well, so where, they're hanging, where they are hanging out. Um, at the moment, and obviously we didn't want to focus too much on COVID and, and being negative nearly and stuff, but looking forward, you know, at the moment we've got people sitting at home on their phones all day, every day. So follow your audience and see where they're, where they're hanging out and then spend that budget that you've got on trying to get them where they are. Um, I looked up my screen report on how much time I you know, picked up my phone on my iPhone the other day and in the last four weeks I picked up my phone like over a thousand times. Um, so you've got those opportunities and people are searching and, and Googling and stuff at the moment because we've got the time. So yeah, um, got lots of those online options, yeah. 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 Follow your audience. Um, yeah, again, anything online, it's really good value for money too, so. Um, sorry, we're putting you back on the, on the spotlight there. Ashley, there's another question about, uh, can you please explain the algorithm for Facebook posts a bit better? And are they no. <laughs> to be using besides the imagery content? Well, I think we can all have it. Okay, have so what was the question, sorry? Can you please explain? Explain the algorithm for Facebook yeah. a bit better, oh and um, are there keywords to be using besides imagery content? So I think there's two questions in one. Maybe we should yeah. have another. the algorithm for Facebook posts. So when when somebody wants to understand the algorithm for anything, we're like, ah, oh. <laughs> this is an interesting question. It's really, it's sometimes, sometimes it's really, really hard to even understand what the hell Facebook are even up to. And just when I think I've got a grasp on it and I've, I've got it solved, they go and change things. At the end of the day, you've got to, you've got to remember to be authentic and not sell on social media through your posts. Um, if you are putting posts out on Facebook that are always, hey, come and buy this, hey, come and buy this, this is what I do, this is what I do, come and buy it, this is how much it is people are just going to switch off. They're not picking up their phones to go on Facebook and Instagram to buy a product. You want to um, kind of casually sneak in and get into their subconscious so that when they're ready to buy, then they just come to you. So you're wanting to form connections with people. Um, that predominantly, obviously the algorithm had a massive overhaul a couple of years ago and everyone panicked and went shit on my organic reach is plummeting, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. The main reason for that change was that Facebook stripped the algorithm right back and went back to basics and what the platform was actually initially designed for, which was connecting with friends and family and community. So as long as your business is playing its part in that and appearing like that, then you're gonna sort of start to play in the hands of the algorithm. Um, other little things you can try is not putting any text in any graphics or images that you pop up. So there is a 20% text rule that Facebook have. If you've got, if your image has more than 20% text in it, then you're automatically going to get a bit of a black mark against your name and the algorithm will rank you a bit lower there. Other things, you know, when you're doing a competition, don't use the word tag, because that actually um, puts alarm bells on Facebook algorithm. And again, they just make your organic reach um, decline a little bit. Um, but in terms of explaining the fa Facebook algorithm, you can have a Google and try and understand <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow they'll probably change it. Um, just keep yeah. doing what you can do, and if you find anything that sparks and that creates engagement and really good reach for your page, then just do more of that for as long as it works. Yeah. Um, I had quite a lot of questions come in about content. The one I was going to pick up on quickly is um, what are the important things to think about in regards to content? Um, I think relevancy is essential. Um, you can't cover everything and you can't talk about everything all at once, but being, uh, being relevant to your clients, pro like 
their problems are what what issues are they having and how are you going to solve them so instead of just saying that um we sell dance dresses make so many people sell dance dresses so you can say oh well you know we have a dance dress um company here we and we'll deliver them to your home and we do free alterations and we'll um we'll be able to help you with fittings after hours oh okay well those are the three problems i had was how am I going to get to you because I work full time and what happens if I need it altered? So just making sure that your content is tailored specifically to your client's needs and wants and solve their problems before they even realize they have them. If that's, if that makes any sense and mm -hmm. um, relevancy. So don't, you don't need to talk about what everybody else is talking about. You don't need to follow what everybody else. Well, those people are using those hashtags. Those people are using those topics. Do what is right for you and what's relevant for you and, and your business and your audience. Yeah. And be personal, be yourself. Yeah. Um, I always tell clients, be yourself as much as you're com as much as you're comfortable being. Um, you know, some clients, you know, like myself, I'm quite happy to put the kids up there and say, you know, swear words and all that sort of thing. Um, at the end of the day, you are trying to form relationships with people on your social media. So if you can do that through um, allowing a bit more of your own personal personality to shine through. And you're going to get better results yeah absolutely it's 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 about authenticity and it's being able to stand out in 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 the, in the middle of all the chatter so you know there's just a lot of conversations going on at the moment there's a lot of content out there. there's a lot of emails there's a lot of social media stuff and you know how do you how do you make people stop and listen to you so just be yourself don't worry about what everybody else is doing and don't worry about how your your content so much is presented mm -hmm. um if it's a blog it's quite informal if it's social media it's quite informal just let your personality and, and what you do shine through because that's what's going to make people want to connect with you oh that you know that that person gets me it's got to be a human if you if i mean if yeah. you put a post up with a with a typo in it it doesn't really fucking matter just comment at the bottom <laughs> and say shit i'm so sorry i've got four kids at home at the moment so i you know had a bad spelling day or whatever just be real um and people will connect with that on emotional level and yeah. then be more likely to remember that post afterwards yeah no absolutely um i had a quick question about forms on websites my most favorite Thing, forms on websites. Uh, we have a lot of forms on our site for applications to courses. We're currently using WordPress and the forms don't work properly, so we have to use SurveyMonkey. Is there a better option? Um, I'm sure Sarah can add on to this, but I'll just say that, you know, forms on websites are notoriously complicated. Um, it depends on so many variables as to why that form might or might not be working, and it's uh, quite difficult to know exactly why that form isn't working. So what we'll do is, I think Sara and I will pick that answer up afterwards. Um, if you're happy to just flick us your, your contact details, we can get in touch with you and just work, just try and ascertain why it is that those forms are not working and you know, maybe you don't need to use SurveyMonkey. That um, it's not, it's not okay. always- Even if you don't use the native WordPress forms, there's so many amazing ways to take answers and, and forms nowadays like i tend to say so if you're already using like a project management system i would advise trying to team it up with that as well personally i use dubsado for all of mine um so that i can keep everything in the same place but you've got survey monkey google forms is really good because you can sort of post that everywhere else um i came across type form the other day too which is pretty amazing and realized you can even take payments for those courses with type forms so there are a lot of answers um but i'd left, definitely like to speak personally to the person that asked that question and see what's going on with their forms and see if we can't get those working rather than using a third party as well yeah uh if you can just flick us your your details um We'll be able to have see if we can untangle that for you. Um, oh, here's a nice one. I have designed our website with Weebly. Is this an okay platform or should I be paying someone to design the site? I'm going to be super biased again because I have <laughs> my chosen platforms. I can't speak for Weebly personally because I haven't used it um, very much, but 
I think um, if we remove the biasness of what platforms I work for with, um, I think if it's working for you, then it's totally fine. Um, I'd be looking at what features does it have? Is, is it good giving you everything that you need or is there features missing? Um, yeah, I would just sort of look at those features and see if it's working for you, then it's totally fine. If not, if it's missing features, then I'd definitely reach out and, and see if we can't move you to a bigger, robust platform that can grow with you. I know that Weebly is lacking in quite a lot of the features, um, but I can't speak specifically for, for Weebly. I'd have to take a look. But overall, if it's working for you, then that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just add on to that, that I've, I've worked a little bit with Weebly um, and I have to say in my experience, it's quite limited in what it can do for you. So if you're planning on scaling at some point or in growing out of whatever um, you've got at the moment, you're going to be faced with a roadblock down the line where you're going to, in order to scale, you're going to have to change the platform. So maybe it's worth getting somebody to have a look at it um, and just aligning that with where you want to go with your website. Um, to see whether you could probably stay on Weebly. It's nothing wrong with Weebly, um, but you know, if you if you do plan on scaling um, any time in the future, it's going to be. A bit I definitely of it. think um, again, it's going back to that initial strategy of looking at what your wants and your needs are for the features of your website. Like, are you just wanting a simple informational website, or are you wanting something that can? Um, a ship a thousand products an hour or a drop ship. Um, one thing that I notice with small platforms like Weebly and Wix is their integrations. Um, I'm not sure if Weebly does, but it's looking at things too, like does this platform integrate with Layby and Afterpay? A lot of those platforms miss those really key things that you might get from other platforms and not with the smaller ones. Yeah, so I think that also ties back into which web website platform is best for me. Um, WordPress is a go-to for so many people because you can make it as small or as big as you like. You, you can have a one-page website and you can have an enterprise um, e-commerce store. So um, you can really scale and and or tailor it down or and you can plug into so many other different options without having to... Um, you know build in extra things so that's what makes a really flexible option for most people but things like Weebly and Squarespace and all of those are still relevant and have space in the in the market for people. yeah yeah um I think we've got another poll question coming up there uh from from Janice I'm just going to pop it on the screen. Um, I know there's a lot of questions coming through and that we're probably not going to be able to get through all of them. So please, we will answer them afterwards. We won't, we won't leave any one of you out. Uh, here we go. It's a $500 question. If I had $500 to spend on advertising, I would spend it on, um, just pick one of the multiple choice options there. Um, again, no right or wrong answer. Just quite interesting to see where we can throw that money into and the results will come up on the page afterwards um yeah feel free to send us a, a, flick us your email address into the q a into a private message if you don't want anybody else to see it or uh, pick up our contact details afterwards if there's a specific question you wanted to ask us and you didn't want us to speak about it in the webinar that's also okay uh, Okay, so that's just, oh, yeah. Oh, wow, Facebook won. <laughs> Facebook won by 81% there. Um, Google Ads, 25%, Instagram, 28 so the social media, yeah, radio, print, and other. I think, um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good reflection on where you'd get a good ROI at the moment, although um, I was quite a fan of, of Google Ads because you can, you can use a really small amount of spend and be able to really test and get quite a lot of data out of out of your reporting there. Um, but Facebook ads is, is is quite a nice one at the moment. How are you finding engagement with the ads versus um, organic engagement at the moment with things like stories and stuff like that? Would you say that it's definitely worth it to plug more into the ads now? Um, engagement across the board is up. Um, than it was, say, six weeks ago. 
Um, so no matter what you're doing at the moment, you're probably going to see your numbers are a little bit greater. Um, you're probably going to find another question I've been getting is what time of the day you should be posting. Um, and at the moment, you can literally post at any time of the day. Um, most of our clients' insights of sorry, there's a lot of banging going on behind me. Um, <laughs> Most of our clients' insights um, have shown that their followers are waking up about six o'clock and then they're literally on social media all day long. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be a webinar without this one, technically. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, engagement across the board is high. Um, as I say, at the moment on paid ads that we're doing on social media for clients, the results are just absolutely blowing my mind every single day. So if you have been thinking about trying social media ads, but you haven't sort of got around to it or you've been a little bit frightened, just give it a crack at the moment. Um, minimum spend of five bucks a day. So, you know, if you run something for a couple of weeks, um, it's not a massive investment. Um, and just see what you get back from it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, just uh, there's a question that would tie into that is that uh, hi Ashley why would a paid ad on Facebook be rejected but a boosted post was okay yeah I saw that one before and I've been sitting yeah. here trying to think of why. Um, maybe reach out to me afterwards on that one I'd like to have a look at both and see if I can figure out why yeah there's a few little things it could be um, the three of you have successfully established your own businesses and become the face of your brands. If any, what kind of teams or support networks are each of you surrounded by to achieve the goals for your clients? You're looking at them right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to say, say my hairdresser, my face lady. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. Around with each other and, um, and like-minded business owners and working with each other. I'm a huge yeah. fan of collaborate over competition as well. Um, so even with other people in our fields, um, we've got the three of us check quite a lot. Um, the Women in Business group has been absolutely fabulous. Um, there's quite a lot of us in there that we're all sort of in the same boat going through the small business stuff together. So, yeah. And I think, like you said, just surrounding yourself with people that um, pep you up. Um, I know Sarah and myself this morning were shitting bricks about doing this, but Tracy <laughs> was, Tracy, you know, helped pep us up. And she was like, come on, guys, you're going to be okay. We can do this, you know. So I think having just friends and stuff around you that give you that confidence that you need. Sometimes I think when you work alone as well, you're in a very small team, it's really hard to to um, let that self-confidence plummet and get stuck in your own little um, thought patterns of I'm not good enough or I don't, I don't actually know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, so I think yeah. just finding those people that you can rely on and help boost you up and help boost them up when they need it. Yeah, and also just being able to go to, to somebody in your business buddy network that you know is going to be totally impartial without a an ulterior motive or a hidden agenda and it's going to go listen what you've done there is completely shit or yeah. what, you've, what you've done there is absolutely amazing you know and they're not going to sugarcoat it but they're not going to kill your confidence either so yeah. there's a huge amount of trust in that as well being able to share ideas and and um okay to to bounce um, stuff off each other and, and when you second guess yourself um, instead of going into that default response you go to your to somebody in your, in your business buddy network and you just go okay I need I really need to take the time and, and just have a look at this and we all do that for each other um, everybody on the screen and people that you can't see on the screen that are hiding there Janice <laughs> um, so I think that's that's really important is, is who you surround yourself with and and your conversations that you choose to be part of um, is is as important as you know the, the the media you choose to consume and all of that makes a makes a big difference on there we go so we can carry on with that quite you know forever and ever we'll have wine by the end of it <laughs> someone just commented and said don't be shitting yourself it's great i'm a professional and i've seen a lot worse <laughs> that makes me real good <laughs> oh that's that's cool um okay going back to oh, there's so many questions but we, we will get to them um by the end, I promise you. Uh, we're getting the clicks, but how do you turn that into money? 
Um, before I give that to Ashley, I'd like to have a, a little. I was going to pass it on to you anyway with your final talk. Oh. So. <laughs> So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of funnels and, and people coming into your website, there's, there's a couple of stages. So appearing in search is, your, is one stage and then getting people to click through to your website is another stage. Um, but then how do you get that, turn that into a conversion? So I think that, I mean, that's a rabbit hole that we can go down now and we can spend hours in it. But um, just the, the fundamentals of your website. So in terms of getting conversions that translate into money, what happens after that person has clicked on your website? And, you know, what kind of service are you offering post that? Are you replying to emails? Are you responding to inquiries? Are you giving them the information that they're asking for? Are you um, taking two days to come back to them? Are you getting back to them straight away? Um, you know, it doesn't just doesn't just end with the website, although that's the way that you get them that mm. you get them in the door. So that'd be a really nice place to start with a website audit in a case like that. You know, it could be that the copy isn't um, communicating the messages that that person's come to find out about. So maybe then they're switching off. It could be that the images are maybe a little bit lacking, or the text is really hard to read on mobile. It could be kind of anything where they yeah. you're getting them to the website, and that's brilliant. But there's something within that that's not triggering them and, and inspiring them to buy. <laughs> Yeah, so I do quite a lot of the website audits. Um, it's I know that my 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 um, my core offering, if you want to call it that, is copywriting. But my I've got a passion for analytics. I'm an analytics junkie. So going through the website audit, we go through all the analytics and we go through the whole customer journey and we try and establish where are those those um, areas where the clients are just not getting through. So you're getting the click to the website, but then nothing's happening after that. Where are the people going? Why are they not clicking through? Why are they not following through and converting? Why do they add stuff to the cart, but then abandon them? Or why are they getting to your landing page, but then all dropping off? All of those kinds of things. And um, that's a really good place to start when you have a website and you're like, okay, well, I had the website for a while and it's just, I know it's not doing well, but I can't work out why. Um, and I can't work out why people are clicking because my report said that I had a hundred visitors, but I'm not actually getting any, any money out of that. No, well, my marketing lady says I've had 200 <laughs> visits, but why yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's where I come in and uh, do the, the website audit and, and I try and untangle everything and work out where, where are the, the problem areas. And often, I mean, so often, it's just some really, really small things. There's a realigning of some elements, or maybe there's a link that isn't working. So, you know, your, your link that people are linking to is broken. You didn't even know that. So sometimes it's just a fresh pair of eyes to have a look at everything. And, and then we, I come back with the plan and go to Sarah and to Ashley and go, okay, how can we make this work? And, and, and how can we unplug those holes so that that whole user experience, the customer experience can flow again so that when somebody clicks on your website, they follow through in the steps that you want them to do and the result in a conversion and that pathway to profit is clear and open for business again. Yeah, well, we can go on about that for hours and hours. <laughs> um, we're gonna run out of time soon. God, I can't believe it's gone so quickly. Um, has popped up yeah. for you, Tracy. That might be oh. a really good one. Um, so it says, so is short better in terms of copywriting or long form? I thought search engines preferred <coughs> form. Um, well, in terms of search engines, like all sorts of forms, um, it depends on it depends on what the search query is. Um, I think Pave will, will address that question a little bit afterwards, but people are using so many different options now for search. They don't just type something into their search bar and say red shoes. They're actually voice searching and that becomes a whole story. So, um, you know, what Google and search engines prefer is they're constantly readapting and realigning to, to keep up with how search is being um, performed. So whether it's text search, it's mobile search, it's voice search and in order to adapt to that, we have to make sure that there is short, short um, form and long form of copywriting so that you have what they call snippets and what you have blogs 
and you have all different types of contents. People search by image. I search by image. If I'm looking for something and I can't find it, um, and I've searched three times with three different combinations of search terms, I hit the images. And when the images come up, that's how I find. So you need to have your, your image labels need to be correct because that could be the difference between you having a sale or not. Um, so, you know, that's, that's definitely something, all different types of um, lengths of copywriting and content is what search engines love. It's about keywords. It's about having, um, being able to answer that question for the search cohesively the first time. So when somebody types in um, something into search, so I use the red shoes all the time, red shoes, and they land on your website and you actually sell red baby shoes, but they were looking for red adult shoes, they'll bounce off. So there you possibly need to have a long tail keyword in there so that when, you when people land on your website and you've answered their question correctly, and they click through to your website, Google's like, okay, that person's answering the question correctly, we'll keep pushing them forward in the queue. Um, there's another question here about tips for growing your Instagram audience. I think that's a good one. More or less the same as we sort of covered before with um, Facebook, just be authentic, um, post frequently. Um, so generally post every couple of days um, and then just post stuff that your audience are interested in um, and be yourself. Look at your insights at least once a month, see what's working, see what's not. Um, using hashtags on Instagram as well. So finding out hashtags that, um, you know, have a popular following for what you're trying to push. Um, and then sort of finding some niche hashtags as well. Hashtags is a whole nother webinar. Um, <laughs> There was another uh, question as well, um, which Sarah asked if she could ask me and I said no, because I didn't want to get into it. Um, it, was about, <laughs> it was about using hashtags on Facebook. Um, so you, I mean, you can pop them on there. They don't serve as important purpose as they do on Instagram. Um, you can pop them on there if you want. It's not going to kind of influence things too dramatically. Um, but they're not as important as they are in an Instagram post. So if, for example, you are cross-posting, so if you're using a tool at the moment where you uh, post on your Instagram page and it automatically shoots it through to Facebook for you, make sure you jump into Facebook afterwards and remove the hashtags out. Um, or alternatively, you could jump back into your Instagram post. Don't touch the post because the algorithm will throw a wobbly, um, but post your um, hashtags in the comments of your Instagram post if you wanted to do it that way. Hmm. Uh, how many um, is there best practice for how many hashtags should be used for each platform, or is that also oh, another way to go? I swear to God, I think the maximum is still thirty. If I'm right, yeah. um, just use a handful of them. Don't go overboard. Don't just do a couple. Again, it's a it's a bit of trial and trial and what's that saying? You know, testing trial and error. Trial yeah. and error. Um, generally, five to six. I think at the moment is is best practice that the big big wigs are saying um, but it changes all the time so just do what works for you um, and if your content is good then the hashtags shouldn't matter as much they shouldn't be as important don't rely on the hashtags <laughs> yeah um, there was a another quick question we'll take there is how often should marketing emails be sent to our customer base so I feel like at the moment, particularly, everybody's completely overwhelmed with emails and everybody's trying to sell them stuff and give them information and trying to get them to sign up to stuff. And I just, from my own inbox, it's just, like, it's just too much. So I feel like marketing emails are effective when you, when you send something, when you've actually just got something to say. Depends mm. a lot on your industry. If you are retail, um, you can have something that goes out once a week, even more than that. Um, but don't send something out just because, oh, I haven't sent something out for a while. If you don't have anything relevant to say, nobody's going to click on it. It's going to go to the bottom of the pile. And next time you actually do have something to say, um, nobody's going to open it. So less is more definitely with marketing emails. Um, make sure that you've got something that if it's in terms of retail, if it's a sale item or if it's a, um, an important announcement of changes to shipping or payments, or if you've got a new feature or product on your website, like those are all really good things that you can talk to your customers about. Um, but keep your frequency on 
the down low and use your social media pages for uh, connecting with your customer base in that way. Don't spam them. Um, um, so once a week, I think would be a, a good thing for, for retail and once a month for everybody else. I don't know how you feel, Ashley and Sarah, if you've got... Um, I think as long as you're keeping okay. it helpful, like your readers need to get something out of the emails. I don't think that they mm -hmm. want, you know, like you were touching base on like sales and, um, and new things that are coming up. Like, I guess one thing when you're crafting your emails is to think about is what are they getting? out of this like is it helpful is it informative or am I just spamming my client base every week in hopes that they'll come and buy my shit basically so keep it keep looking at them of what value you can provide for them and they'll keep reading your emails and they'll let you yeah. know if what you're producing is interesting as well again just look at the data and look at the analytics in the back end and if no one's fucking opening it change it or don't do it at all and spend your time on doing something else yeah, because also creating the content for emails is time consuming and yeah. it's in business, all of this. So, totally. you know, if, if you've spent a couple of hours putting that together or even worse, you've paid somebody um, for a couple of hours to put it together and nobody's opening them, uh, mm -hmm. time to just um, revisit that strategy and work out what it is that you're saying and why are people not reading it and going to your business buddies or getting some professional advice on, on what that is. But um, before we finish, I just wanted to, to add in something else when it comes to professional advice is to how important the people are that work with you and work with you in your business. So everybody works with web designers and copywriters and marketing people. But I think that when we start seeing those people as an extension of our own business, so if you're using a courier because they're the cheapest, but they keep letting you down and they keep letting your customers down, um, they're actually letting you down as a business. And if you're using somebody because or a personal relationship or they're the best, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best for you and, or, or the best for your business. And I think it's okay. And particularly now, it's, it's a good idea to have those really difficult conversations about what you need in your business and who you're going to work with and for what reason. You know, um, just because somebody was the best at the time when, when, you, when you came on board with them doesn't mean that they're good for you now. So I think that we've got to be really particular about all the service providers that we plug into our business because they essentially become an extension of what you do and, and your service levels to your clients. So choose, choose those people that you work with wisely. And, and if you can't trust them or you're not happy with the service, you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea to get a second opinion on, on those things, definitely. It's, it's like, it, I suppose, um, Ashley would say the same thing. It's like, well, you're spending $500 a month on marketing, but you're not getting any leads from it. Don't keep throwing money into it. Reassess what you're doing and find out different ways you can do that. And that applies to the, the people that you work with and plug into your business as well. Um, yeah, uh, there was a, another question here that with your name in it, Ashley. How much does paid reach cost? And is that on top of the round about $500 per month that you suggested before, Ashley? Okay, so if you're looking at doing um, paid Facebook ads, so, so kind of looking at two different things. So ads on Facebook will cost um, at least $5 a day. Um, boosting, I haven't boosted things in a little while, so I'm not even too sure on what the minimum spend is now, but you can boost something for like 20 bucks a week and you know you might pay to get a few more eyeballs on it. Um, so that would be um, included in that $500 a month um, budget that I talked about earlier. I'd just allocate, you know, you could allocate 100 or 150 bucks or something into Facebook, Facebook mm -hmm. ads. Um, another question, if we can squeeze that in. If you tag another business in a post, do you really get more exposure? It'll increase a little bit, but I guess you're always hopeful when you do something like that, that then they will pick it up and post it onto their page to all of their followers as well. And then you're also sort of hopeful that they might return the favor later on. So it just shows, I mean, because obviously like for us doing this webinar, we were like posting and tagging each other and stuff like that. Um, I didn't notice that any of those posts were seen a whole lot more than they would have been. 
But obviously my brand is then exposed to Tracy's followers and then exposed to Sarah's followers who then potentially might come over to my page and give me a like as well and start following me. Yeah, and I, I think that you, know, you get an opportunity to piggyback on the audiences, yeah. but it's not always a foolproof one size fits all solution. Nope. Um, yeah, Dennis is going to pop on now and switch the lights on in our, in our um, club here and tell us it's time to go home. Um, there's still some questions from anonymous people. Uh, it would be really great if you can send us your, your contact mm. details so we can just get back to you privately. And, and if you don't have a name there, we can't um, respond to you. So don't be shy. <laughs> oh, sorry that we have to wrap it up. It's a really, really great conversation going on, and I really love all the questions coming in. Um, but yes, I'm, 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 some people have had to leave the meeting. So, anyway, um, thank you so I'll much. <laughs> Thanks so <laughs> much. I was um, stall. Sorry. Oh, that's all good. Um, I just want to say a big thank you, um, Ashley, Sarah and Tracy for your time and sharing your knowledge and views uh, so openly in this webinar. Um, thanks also to those of you who tuned in. I hope you learned some useful information that you can take away with you and implement. Um, all people are encouraged to contact their own pro professional advisors for specific advice or these three um, ladies from the webinar. Uh, in a day's time, all attendees will be sent a survey link. Also provided in that email will be a link to our Ashburton District Council webinar series. So you can watch this webinar and others from the series on demand. So thanks again. And most importantly, stay safe in your bubbles. Thanks so much, Janice, for having us. Yeah, thank you, Janice. And thank you, everybody, for coming along. Yeah, thank you. It was really nice. Matua. Okay. Bye. Bye.